Hello, welcome to Denton's Tales of the Viking Age. Now, this video is called The Battle of Clontarf. Well, sort of. That's because it isn't about the Battle of Clontarf as such, though I, I will be talking about the actual battle as well. No, this is about a 20th century theatrical representation of it and my own personal participation in that somewhat, um, shall we say, inglorious event. For some years, I was an actor on the Dublin stage. I appeared in all the major theatres of the city at one time or another, the Abbey, the Gaiety, the Olympia, the Gate among them, until the precarious and unpredictable employment prospects of the Irish theatre scene at that time decided me to take up an occupation that meant one would work 52 weeks per year and get paid every week, and not to have to go to auditions along with 30 other people for the same part, or kiss somebody's arse in order to get it. Now, the Battle of Clontarf took place on Good Friday in the year 1014 at a place called, well, not surprisingly, Clontarf, which in 1014 was an area along the coast of Dublin Bay, some distance to the north of the city. Today it's one of the inner suburbs. The battle actually spread over a considerable area from Clontarf itself right out into the countryside and was fought between a united force of Norsemen and Dublin and Leinster Irish and the usurping King Brian Boru of Munster. Generations of Irish schoolchildren learned how the great and good and ever so pious King Brian Boru fought at Clontarf to drive the Vikings out of Ireland, giving his life in the process and freeing Holy Mother Ireland from the evil pagans. But in the, in the immortal words of John Wayne, the hell he did. For one thing, most of the Vikings had converted to Christianity by that time. And they were led by the Hiberno-Norse king of Dublin, Cedric Olafsson, known as Silkbeard, himself half Irish by birth and a Christian, who had gone on a pilgrimage to Rome in 1028 AD and founded Dublin's Christchurch Cathedral around the same time. King Brian Boru, far from wanting to drive anybody out of anywhere, simply wanted the kingdom of Dublin for himself, having already acquired a few other kingdoms along the way. He was not the most popular man in Ireland. The Dublin Irish sided with the Vikings, as did King Maelmorda of Leinster, reinforced by Vikings under Sigurd of Orkney and Brodir of Man, while Brian had the assistance of two kings from Connaught, among others. Brian's side won the battle, though he himself and both his sons and grandson were killed, as were Maelmorda, Brodir and Sigurd. King Silkbeard had wisely stayed in Dublin, holding the garrison there in reserve and watching the various standards in the distance as the battle progressed. And not only did he survive the uh, battle himself, but he continued as King of Dublin on and off up to 1036 AD. The Battle of Clontarf has always been seen for some reason as a defining moment, freeing Ireland from foreign rule though in effect it had very little real influence on that. Norse control in the country was already declining. Intermarriage between Norse and Gael and increasing conversion to Christianity adding considerably to that fact. And the, the same Hiberno-Norse king continued to rule Dublin for another 22 years after the battle that supposedly drove out the Vikings. Anyway, that was the historical Battle of Clontarf. Now to the theatrical version, a somewhat, a somewhat smaller battle, to be sure, with about ten warriors on each side, which was about as many as we could fit on the stage with any degree of safety while swinging swords about. As it turned out, that was a very good thing. The play was entitled Let the Ravens Feed, with the alternate uh, title of Cormlada, and it featured events leading up to and including the Battle of Clontarf. And opening night was Friday, December the 5th, 1969, in the little Peacock Theatre, which is situated under and is part of Dublin's famous Abbey Theatre. I was Lorcan, a warrior, among other things, most of the cast playing several parts. And that role came close to ending my theatrical career in a rather spectacular manner, which is the main point of this video. But, but bear with me, it, it's worth waiting for. There, there, there's other things coming first. Anyway, the play became rather famous in the world of the Dublin theatre at that time, though for all the wrong reasons. What was intended to be a serious historical play, and there was nothing wrong with the play itself, it, it was very good, it ended up like something from Monty Python or Mel Brooks. To begin with, 
The costume designer, for some reason best known to themselves in some kind of brainstorm, decided to put most of the cast in Hessian fabric. Hessian fabric, which gave the impression that we were all wearing coal sacks with holes cut in them for the head and arms. And there was standardized footwear for most of us as well. Rubber boots. Wellington boots, uh, made by Dunlop. Now, I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but I very much doubt that anyone at the Battle of Clontarf wore Wellington boots made by Dunlop or anyone else, since rubber wasn't discovered by Europeans until 1735. The very obvious uh, impossible modernity of the wellies, as they were called, uh, as we all clumped around on the stage. You, you know, you can't walk elegantly in wellies. You sort of plod like a, a farmer walking over a ploughed field. That, that raised titters enough. But what really made the name of the production, literally in this case, was the death of Brian Boru. Now, it's important to understand that the Peacock is an intimate theatre. It seats 150 people. And, and the first row of the audience are only a few feet from the edge of the stage. If I were sitting in the front row, that mirror behind me would be the stage. That close. King Brian was dead. He was laid out on a bier to be mourned by his faithful warriors and kinsmen. The king is dead. He has given his life for dear old Aaron. A sad a supposedly moving scene. One that will live on in the history of Ireland. A solemn moment. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Playing dead bodies on stage, especially in intimate theatres like the Peacock, it is challenging because actors have to breathe, and the chest of a corpse going up and down it rather spoils the effect. Lying dead on a beer for some considerable time, trying only to take tiny, unnoticeable breaths, is not something actors really like to do. So the director had a brainwave. King Brian wouldn't be laid out sideways to the audience, which would be the usual method of staging such a scene. No, he would be laid out with his feet towards the audience. Thus, any problem with breathing would be taken care of. The audience would be unable to see it. Excellent. All they would see from the house would be his feet. And they did. Since the king was feet first towards the audience, and they were only a few feet away, remember, the soles of his boots were clearly visible, as was the word Dunlop on them in very large raised letters right across the sole. The overhead stage lighting, of course, throwing the letters into high relief, making them even more obvious than they would otherwise have been. Unfortunately, the director didn't notice that fact at the dress rehearsals. On opening night, the audience did. They laughed. They laughed on every night after that as well, for the entire run of the show. We in the cast christened the play The Wellington Boot Show, a title that gained some notoriety around Dublin theatrical circles. Have you seen the Wellington Boot Show over at the Peacock? I, 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 you have to see it, you have to see it. So they're all wearing coal sacks and wellies, for feck's sake. Yes. <clears throat> I know Oscar Wilde said the only bad publicity is no publicity, but I don't think that he had big rubber boots that sort of flop when you walk in them, being used for a play set in 1014 AD in mind when he said it. But that wasn't all. Oh no, oh no. There were other unfortunate events before we even got the curtain up on opening night, and I haven't got anywhere near my own story yet. Now we had carefully rehearsed a battle scene, choreographed for both effect and safety, and we spent quite a lot of rehearsal time on it. We had sticks, broom handles and the like, good enough to rehearse with. The actual swords didn't put in an appearance until the dress rehearsal. Comes the dress rehearsal. Well, all went fairly well up to the Battle of Clontarf, but there we ran into a slight problem. We had all the weapons from the property department. There wasn't really ever much call for swords suitable for the 11th century, but we had what there was, just enough to go around. But half the warriors had real swords. Something um, something like this one. Not, uh, not sharp, of course, the edge is, is quite blunt, but it is a real sword. It's made of steel and it's rather heavy. The other half of the warriors had wooden prop swords made of a light wood, something like balsa wood that you might make little model planes out of, painted silver to look like metal, and intended to be carried for effect, but not actually used. So, the um, 
The Battle of Clontarf lasted, oh, I suppose, what, about uh, a minute or so? After which half the army still had swords, the, the real ones, while the others just had the hilt left in their hand and the stage was littered with bits of wood and splinters. Oh, fuck. Quick, call the, call the theatrical costumiers. There were only two in Dublin at the time. Get any swords they have. Well, a few phone calls later, we managed to get enough real swords to go around so the great battle could go ahead on opening night without us having to resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand unarmed combat like a Hong Kong Kung Fu movie. Now, at last, comes my personal story. I had a dramatic fight rehearsed with another actor in which we would savagely attack one another. Rather, uh, well, rather like this. Yes, something, something like that. And after which I would run my opponent through with my sword in the standard theatrical manner by shoving it past him off stage with the audience so it would seem to go straight through him. He would touch his guts and stagger off the stage to die, so as not to clutter up the stage. Oh, very impressive. Very impressive. And what was good was that we would be right down by the edge of the stage. Center stage as well, so for a few moments, we would have almost the full attention of the audience on us. All 150 of them would be watching us. Unfortunately, as it turned out. As I faced my opponent, sword gripped in my hand, ready to do battle, I noticed there was something well, there was something rather odd about him. He seemed somewhat uh, unsteady on his feet, and there, there was a strong smell of whiskey that, that seemed to envelop him like an alcoholic cocoon that, that moved around with him. Oh, shit, he's pissed. He looked at me with, with, with a strange, somewhat unsettling expression on his face, a malevolent smile as he rocked slightly to and fro, murmuring something to himself. <laughs> then he laughed, an evil sort of laugh. <laughs> and he charged. He gave a roar. And he ran at me like a bull at a gate, sword raised. Now, as I said, the fight was carefully rehearsed. Strike high, strike low, block, thrust, parry. Every move performed over and over until we could do it at full speed. That oh-so-careful planning, of course, went straight out the window. Along with the empty bottle of whatever brand it was he'd consumed in the dressing room before the curtain went up. I was expecting a blow towards my leg. I was ready to block it. He swung at my head. Fortunately, my reflexes were good or I wouldn't be telling you about it now. And I was able to block the blow. A bit like, oh, fuck! The next carefully rehearsed blow should have been at my head. But he swung at my leg. Full force. Again, I blocked it. <laughs> he was swinging at me as hard as he could, with a real sword, laughing his head off. <laughs> and it was, it was obvious. He was trying to hit me. What should have been a simulated stage combat, and perfectly safe, had become a real fight, and very dangerous. We were genuinely fighting. The little bastard was trying to kill me. And I, of course, was trying to prevent that. The, the, the other warriors had noticed this, and they were sort of moving away, giving us room. Since our swords were going places none of them had expected, and, of course, by now they'd caught the overpowering whiff of alcohol that was moving around with my opponent. He'd been partaking of the juice of the barley in his dressing room, so nobody had noticed his inebriated state until his arrival on the stage. I realized I had to kill him quickly and get him off the stage before somebody got hurt, especially me. Forget the prearranged fight, just get him off the stage. So I grabbed his sword arm, thrust my sword apparently through him, and pulled it back out, and waited for him to stagger off stage and die. He laughed. He'd just been run through with a sword, and he stood there and tittered like a schoolgirl being tickled with a feather. <laughs> By this time, the audience had noticed. 
There are only a few feet away, for feck's sake, right down at the edge of the stage is us. And I just stabbed a man who seemed to think being skewered with a sword through his guts was on a par with the funniest joke he'd ever heard. All eyes were on us. The Battle of Clontarf had sort of slowed down behind us. They were all watching us out the corner of their eye, right down their centre stage, and unsure of what to do, and fighting almost in slow motion. By this time, he should be dead, and I will be engaging someone else. There were men waiting for prearranged action with me, which, of course, I couldn't get to since I was occupied with the moving pub. I ran him through again, very dramatically, Arr! and I whispered, Die! which at that moment I really wished he would do. He seemed to think that was absolutely side-splitting. <laughs> I was sorely tempted to make the fight even more realistic than it already was and beat him to death with my sword. I, I, I had to put an end to this. So I put a foot behind his leg, pushed him backwards and took him down onto the stage, flat on his back. Die, you bastard! I hissed in a stage whisper, though in the tiny peacock it would have been quite audible right at the back of the house. He was still cackling happily. <laughs> I took my sword in both hands, like this. I raised it high in the air, the blade glinting in the lights, every eye in the audience fixed on that deadly blade, ready to bring down death. And I brought it down with a mighty shout, <laughs> apparently skewering him to the ground. He jerked and twitched as he laughed hysterically. <laughs> he was like a beetle on pins, sort of going round and round. And I gave up. I just stood up and left him, going off to fight the next man I was supposed to engage. He was pretty much just standing there, waiting for me, trying to look like he was actually doing something. The felled warrior, run through repeatedly and pinned to the ground with a sword thrust, got up giggling to himself, and wobbled back into the battle, swinging his sword in all directions. <laughs> he, he was finally dragged off the stage, still laughing, by a couple of actors brave enough to go near him. I can only imagine the audience's puzzlement. Who was this seemingly immortal warrior? A man who could not be killed? Was he perhaps, was he perhaps really a god? Thor or Tyr? come down from Hasgarda to, to join the battle? I, I think it's fair to say that the Battle of Clontarf lost much of the dramatic, blood-soaked terror of combat that it was supposed to represent. But there's more to this. Oh yes, oh yes, there's more. That wasn't the end of my sozzled opponent's theatrical activities, though fortunately I had nothing to do with it, when he was eventually able to bring an entire production to a drunken, dead stop. Not, not just a battle, the entire show. Not everyone could do that. He could. Incredible as it might seem, that actor continued to work in the Dublin theatre for some time after Let the Ravens Feed, which is, well, incredible. Eventually, he got the part of Sir Joseph Porter in Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta, HMS Pinafore. Enter Sir Joseph, resplendent in his magnificent uniform as First Lord of the Admiralty, a blue-tailed coat covered in gold braid, a fore-and-aft hat with white feathers on it. Dress sword hanging at his side, knee breeches, accompanied by his sisters and his cousins, whom he reckons up by dozens. Now give three cheers, I'll lead the way, says the captain. Hurrah, hurrah, hooray! Sir Joseph is supposed then to come on and sing his opening number. I am the monarch of the seas, the ruler of the Queen's Navy. Only he didn't. Once again, he'd uh, overindulged in the dressing room. He stood there. The orchestra played the introduction again. The conductor gives him the cue. He blinked owlishly around at the audience. Hmm. Hmm. He said, This is a load of bollocks. Fuck off. Turned around and walked off the stage. HMS Pinafore sank without trace. He never worked again in the Dublin theatre for some reason. I wonder why. Oh well, that concludes this little look at my theatrical connections with Viking Dublin and the famous Battle of Clontarf. Long ago as it was, the, the Wellington Boot Show lives on in my memory. I can't forget it. I have tried.
But we managed to take that production to such glorious heights of underachievement that it lives on in my mind as fresh as if it had occurred yesterday. I am rather proud of it in one way, however, and that is that my skill with a sword saved me. I can honestly say that I have engaged in actual combat. I have been in battle with a sword and I survived. Not many people can say that. Until next time, let me just say farewell. Oh, oh, um, and if you are ever involved in a theatrical production and you feel like a drink, wait till the curtain comes down. Bye for now.